Good evening. Welcome. My name is Andrew Torrance, and I'm one of the organizers of these lectures, alongside with my friends Judith Wolfe um, and Eric Priest. Um, I should also add that this lecture is supported by a generous grant from the Blankmeyer Foundation. So it's wonderful for us to be able to start up these lectures again. Um, we're hoping to have a number more lectures in the future. Um, we're yet to organize the future lectures, but if you keep an eye on the website, um, you'll be able to see them when they're advertised. Um, also, just before I introduce this evening's speaker, you'll notice that there are um, surveys out and, out and about. So if you're able to fill those in, that would be greatly appreciated. And also if you're able to put them down here at the front, that would be great. And also, if you're attending these lectures for the first time, or we don't have your email, you can put your email address on the handouts, and that means it will be able to inform you about future lectures. Now to this evening's speaker. So Professor Megan Sullivan is the Wilsey Family Collegiate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. She serves as the director of the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, which is a think tank which seeks to promote issue-engaged, inclusive, and interdisciplinary studies of questions that affect our ability to lead valuable and meaningful lives. Professor Sullivan's research focus has primarily been on questions relating to time, modality, rational planning, value theory, and religious belief. And she has two books, one on time biases, published with Oxford University Press, and another book that she co-wrote with Paul Blaschko, uh, with Paul Blaschko called The Good Life Method, which is a very popular book which I would strongly encourage everyone to, to check out. And she's currently working on another book um, that is looking at the role that love plays in grounding moral, political, and religious reasoning, which is tentatively, tentatively entitled Agavism, Moral Responsibility and Our Inner Lives. So this is closely related to the lecture that she'll be giving this evening. I'll also add that Professor Sullivan has created one of the most popular courses at the University of Notre Dame, which is on the topic um, of her second book on good God and the good life, which has become quite renowned. Okay, and this course introduces students to big philosophical questions concerning happiness, morality, and meaning. And so Megan is incredibly well prepared and disposed to give tonight's James Gregory lecture. So it is an enormous privilege and a tremendous honor to welcome Professor Sullivan here this evening to address the question, should we love everyone? Over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Can you guys all hear in the back? Sounding good? All right. It is such a pleasure. I, it's, not, it's not an overstatement to say I've been waiting two years to give this lecture. And I feel for you guys an audience because it's, it's tough after you've got two years worth of ideas for a book bottled up and you haven't had a chance to express them to then finally be able to unleash it. But that's what's going to happen here tonight. As Andrew mentioned, I've been working on a philosophy book about the parable of the Good Samaritan and how we might read that parable as providing a moral theory that could guide us or at least provoke interesting debate about the kinds of questions that face our moral lives in the 21st century. I gave a talk at St. Leonard's School this afternoon where I just focused on the parable of the Good Samaritan and all of the interesting and difficult philosophical questions it raises. And I posed the question in the title slide to a group of 80 pupils at St. Leonard's. And you guys will be shocked to learn that I think 0% of them think the answer to this question is yes. So I was, I was horrified as their fellow human, but I was excited as a philosopher because the engine that runs philosophy is controversy. If you're a philosopher and you're not saying something that's provocative, you're not doing your job correctly. And so I'm hoping that that same spirit of controversy will spill over into the lecture here this evening, which is not about the Gospel of Luke, but you'll see is certainly inspired by some of those ideas. The way this talk is going to work is I am going to speak for about 45 to 50 minutes saying increasingly controversial and implausible things about our relationship to strangers. 
And you should be thinking about when you would like to object and write down your questions or objections. And then there will be a period of about 30 to 40 minutes of Q&A and discussion. I've also prepared about 100 slides for a 45 minute talk. I'm not going to get through all of them, but I've prepared for your objections. And the most fun part of this afternoon of philosophy will be hopefully the back and forth about what we think about these questions. So hopefully that sounds exciting. If not, you can quietly like, dismiss yourself to the toilet and nobody will, nobody will care. So one of the topics that got me thinking about this question a few years ago was hearing a lot of discussion in the news about how social media was helping us discern patterns of racism in our love lives. So the first big study that came out on this, at least the first one that I became aware of, involved this free online dating app in the United States called OkCupid. Okay Just raise your hands, how many of you guys are familiar? Maybe it exists in the UK too. It's a free dating app. People use it to find friends. They also use it to find various kinds of romantic relationships. And OkCupid okay was able to collect a huge data set about how people interact with strangers online, especially when they're of a mind to start up a friendship or a romantic relationship. And one thing that they discovered looking at five years of data from how people use their social media site is that people are in fact very racially biased when it comes to who they will initiate a conversation with online. One of the worst groups to be a member of is to be a black man or an Asian man looking for a heterosexual romantic connection online. You're far less likely to have somebody initiate contact with you than if you were a white man. There's also all, all kinds of other racial biases that we're generally aware of existing in society, but now we have hard data that shows how people interact with this app are following these biases. The OkCupid okay data also provoked a really interesting discussion in the tech industry about whether or not using these algorithms to form friendships online or to form romantic connections online were in fact exacerbating underlying patterns of racism in the societies that use them. And so the reasoning, and this is something that OkCupid okay and that Match.com and other major tech firms started to seriously look into, the thought is that these algorithms get trained on the preferences of the users. And if the preferences of the users have these really strong racial biases, the algorithm then starts serving up options of new strangers to interact with using those same racial biases, so expanding those biases in really interesting ways. And there's an open question if you run a major social media platform about whether or not you want your platform to exacerbate underlying strains of racism in your community. That's a really interesting question, and, and I, I certainly encourage you to look at some of the really interesting work that's come out in the last eight to 10 years from sociologists, political scientists, and people who work on technology ethics about what we should do about it. I'm a philosopher, so I'm actually interested in the more personal question. What do you, as an individual who might use one of these social media sites, or who at least in the, is in the business of forming new relationships with people, what should you make of the fact of knowing that you have these biases in the patterns with which you form relationships with others? There's a very interesting podcast called Invisibilia. This is also very popular in the United States. It studies uh, how people use data from psychology in their everyday life. And they had a really fascinating episode a few years ago where they interviewed a college student who had been using one of these dating apps and who realized she had a racialized pattern into who she would initiate contact with online for dating. And then she decided to undertake a self-imposed year of trying to decolonize her love life. So basically, any time the dating app would deliver somebody from her preferred racial group, which was Asian and white men to her, she would swipe, I don't, I don't use these dating apps, she would swipe them away and instead try to expose herself more to men who were in a different racial group, the one that she was not preferring. So she went on this self-imposed strategy of trying to, to make her preferences less sensitive to race. And as you can imagine, horrible moral and psychological things ensued as a result of this program. This is definitely not a way to try to morally regiment your dating or friend life. But this got me thinking, what is a right way to morally regiment your dating and friend life? Maybe you think this is not an issue. And if you don't think this is an issue, you're probably going to like hate the rest of this talk. Because one of the big assumptions I'm going to make is that we should feel weird when we realize we have these racialized patterns about who we're willing to communicate with in these media sites. But 
I think that one of the most interesting things about the era of social media is that it's provided hard data to back up something we already probably vaguely knew about ourselves, but were unwilling to explicitly confront. Namely, that the people that we're willing to extend our love and concern to tend to fall into groups and arbitrary patterns that we explicitly disavow, that we don't want to be part of our moral lives. So I'll, I'll put my own friend data out on the line. I have, I have more friends than this now, since I took this picture, by the way. But when I took this screenshot initially, I had 1,917 deeply held, meaningful online relationships on Facebook. <laughs> And it matters a great deal to me as a philosopher and as a person who's trying to live a good life that I not be racist. But I also know if you do a survey of that data set of people who I've cultivated friendships with on the Facebook app, the vast majority of people that you'll find are people who are white, who have roughly the same education as I do, and who are American. So when I become aware of this bias in my friendship life and my loving concern, what should I do? And I think that that question is even more fundamental than the question about what should Mark Zuckerberg do or what should OKCupid do to try to make sure that their algorithms are moral and just. Because one of the things that the company needs to know about is what kind of moral standards the users are going to hold themselves to or ought to hold themselves to when it comes to forming friendships and developing romantic attachments. So that's going to be the theme of the talk today, is just what are our reasons for forming friendships and developing romantic attachments? I'm actually not even going to talk that much about romantic attachments, partially because you guys should definitely not take any romantic advice from me, for reasons I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. But also because I think that the, the friendship and more basic loving question is much more interesting than the question about how we initiate sexual relationships online. So I'm going to set that aside and really focus on the much more PG question about how we interact and generally form friendships online. And I'm going to say some controversial things that are eventually going to circle back if I time this talk correctly to this idea about loving everyone in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, so to get us going, I'm not going to do all of this in the talk, but I wanted to give you a sense of this book that I'm trying to write. And here's the basic flow of how the book is going, and you, this will also maybe provoke some questions. First, philosophers have, for at least 2,300 years, struggled with this question about what reasons we could possibly have for loving other people. And so one of the things I want to remind you of and I want to remind my readers of is it's always been a hard question to figure out how we have reasons for love. And it's always felt like an important question, one that we can't just shuttle aside, say, oh, love's a mystery, love is irrational. That's actually turned out to be unsatisfactory for us for most of our moral history. So that's what we're going to spend the most time on today. All of the crazy things philosophers have tried to say to explain why we might have a reason that lives up to our own standards for loving another person. The second part of the talk, that, that's already going to be crazy enough, but the second part of the talk, if we get to it, is even crazier, which is trying to articulate the moral theory that we have a really strong, insistent moral reason to love absolutely everyone with dignity. This is the claim that 100% of the pupils of St. Leonard's School disavowed this afternoon. And they didn't just casually disavowed. Some of them hunted me down after the talk to remind me about how stupid this moral theory was. <laughs> So in the book, I want to spend a lot of time articulating this moral theory and not making it soft, like really not backing off from it. It is a pretty demanding moral theory, but arguing that it deserves to be a contender. Then I think that we oftentimes treat topics like the parable of the Good Samaritan as somehow off limits for philosophizing because it's part of scripture, because it's part of a major world religion's tradition. But I think that it's a really philosophically interesting piece of the Bible that raises lots of questions that regardless of your background, religious commitments, you should pay attention to. And so I'm not going to get into that so much in the talk today. It'll be there for Q&A. But in the book, I'm very interested in learning how to read this passage of the gospel like a philosopher and not necessarily um, keeping it off limits or not questioning it. And then the final two parts of the book are trying to defend this extremely demanding, somewhat crazy moral theory against all of its objections, and then trying to offer advice for how somebody might live according to this moral theory, about how it might change our practices and our political views if we really took this seriously. We're not going to get to that at all today, but you guys might think of some of that in questions. We're really going to focus on the first two. Uh oh, I froze. There we go. All right, so let's talk about arbitrariness. 
This is where the, raise your hand if you're a philosopher in the audience. All right, this is where you guys are going to hate this talk. So I'm serving up these objections to you, Aaron. Arbitrariness is bad. It's bad. It's a, a big part of moral theory is trying to reduce the amount of arbitrariness that's in our thinking and our behaviors. A lot of philosophers are going to fight me on this point, but this is one of my deeply held moral views. And I think in many aspects of life, when arbitrariness gets pointed out to us, we realize that something's gone wrong and we should try to get rid of the arbitrariness. One example of this that I noted about a year and a half ago, right as the COVID vaccines were starting to come online, the New York Times had this really interesting long piece that they wrote just pointing out all of the arbitrariness about who had access to the vaccine and who didn't and how that was affecting their lives. And they had this really fantastic graphic, I mean, it was really disheartening, but it was beautiful, that just showed for pairwise different people who lived in different parts of the world or who had different jobs or who had different medical statuses and they would be in green if they had access to the COVID vaccine and red if they didn't and as you watch through this long evolving list that the New York Times created you realize oh my gosh this life and death access to this life and death vaccine is based on perfectly arbitrary features of who somebody is you're meant to have a moral feeling about that conclusion this is wrong like it would be better if there was something more systematic or something more fair, something more just about how this vaccine was offered. We also think, and the entire field of economics, I think, is based on this assumption, that if you realize that you have a deep form of arbitrariness in your preferences as a consumer, this is something that you ought to try to mitigate. So, for example, there's a grocery store in South Bend called Martin's, and I shop there. And Martin sells two kinds of carrots. One brand of carrots has R2-D2 from Star Wars on it. I'm not lying. The other brand of carrots doesn't have any Star Wars character on it. The Star Wars car carrots cost more than the generic carrots. For somebody who's a rational nutrition purchasing agent who realizes the only thing at the end of the day that matters about carrots is what the carrots made up of and how much they cost, being willing to pay more money for Star Wars carrots is irrational. Once my accountant points that out to me, I should feel some pressure to try to buy the not R2-D2 carrots. I mean, you can make it, if you, if you think it's fine for me to buy the Star Wars carrots, then what you need to do is somehow get rid of that arbitrariness. You need to say, well, the amount of joy you get from buying Star Wars branded vegetables, that in and of itself is a rational reason to care about those carrots, in which case that's fine. You've granted arbitrariness is bad, you're just trying to find some good reason, like, oh, the, oh, it totally makes sense that there'd be Star Wars carrots, whatever. Arbitrariness is bad. How do we make the claim that arbitrariness is bad into a more serious philosophical principle? This is for the benefit of those philosophers that raise their hands. Most of this talk is not going to involve long, detailed slides like this. But here's the principle that I believe in my philosophical heart of hearts. I think that the kinds of attitudes that form our most serious moral reasons or rational reasons in the case of the carrots, they ought to be insensitive to arbitrary features of the situation. And when we discover that we are sensitive to arbitrary features of a situation, then we ought to try to get rid of that sensitivity or manage it in some way. I also think, and this might come up in this talk, but at the very least it comes up quite a bit in the book, that if some kind of attitude gives you a really strong reason to do something or hope for something or believe something in one situation, that it gives you that same reason with that same strength in all the other situations where you encounter that kind of reason. Um, this will become obvious maybe in a second. I gave you some examples of why arbitrariness is bad. Let's talk about why this is problematic for the case of love. And to do this, I've been dancing around this question for a minute and now I need to face it head on. What are we talking about when we talk about an attitude of love towards another person? Um, there's a lot of different takes on this. How many of you guys watched Ted Lasso? Oh my gosh, I love this show so much. One of the very best episodes, uh, I think, happens in the second season, where Ted, it opens with the, the team that's a soccer team, a football team, it's a football team, 
They just lost a game, and Coach Lasso is trying to give them this pump-up talk. And he talks about how he believes in rom communism, which is the moral theory that comes from watching a lot of romantic comedies, where two people, generally two beautiful heterosexual people between ages 16 and 40, encounter each other and immediately are starstruck in a kind of irrational or irrational way with one another. And then they go through a series of misadventures and then they discover that they will enjoy a flourishing life by being together and then they end up together. And this is part of Lasso's speech about I don't know what. It has something to do with why the football team should have hope. This is one view about what love is an attitude is that, that, that says love is kind of totally irrational. It's ruled by something like the fates or something that no person could exercise rational control over. And if this is your view of love, you're also going to hate the rest of this talk, because then the, well, the whole question about how we might try to think about the morality of our loving attitudes towards other people is just going to be off the table. But I am not a rom communist. I'm not even a regular communist. So that's not going to be a view that we're going to spend a lot of time on. Here's another view that is really popular in philosophy, and I think also in theology, but I'm also not going to spend a ton of time on tonight. And if you really care about this, I'm happy to argue with about it, you about it. One of the high schoolers really cared about this and wanted to fight me about it. This is the view that there is no single attitude of love that we have towards other people. Rather, there's a family of attitudes of love, and they're all essentially different from each other. There's romantic love. There's maybe the love of friendship, what the Greeks called philia. Maybe there's the love that you have towards God. We might call this like agapic love. And each of those is just it's a distinct attitude. Romantic love, erotic love could be in those categories. They're all distinct attitudes. And when we talk about the morality of any of these attitudes, we have to be really clear about which one we're talking about. So there's a moral code for romantic or erotic love. There's a moral code for friendship. There's a moral code for loving God. And they all might be just very different, because these attitudes are very different. I don't think that that's the approach that we should take. One, because I'm not sure the attitudes are so different that they have to be put in these essentially different categories. I think it makes more sense to talk about romantic love as being a kind of love that's very similar to the love that you have for close friends, but has this extra dimension to it that's expressed romantically. I kind of prefer that, like there are different styles of the same basic operating system of love. I also think that it just doesn't tend to make a lot of empirical sense about how our relationships govern our lives. So you might think that I meet somebody maybe when I'm 16 years old and we're friends for a decade and that's one form of love, but gradually over time maybe it blossoms into romantic love. Maybe we marry and we have a family and maybe over time that attitude also changes from a kind of erotic love into much more of a kind of deeper friendship or more serious love. Maybe that person dies prematurely and I still love them even after death, even when we couldn't have a relationship. But that love is also mediated through some of my views about God and God's relationship between me and that person. That my attitude towards that same person over the course of a long life can go through all of these different epicycles. And it's not the case that I'm just like snap, like exiting one kind of love and entering another one each time. It seems to be the same attitude that just has different styles as it's expressed. If you disagree with me on this, which C.S. Lewis and Plato definitely would, again, happy to fight about it later. Here is what I think of when I think of love as a potentially moral attitude. And I came up with this list in the very, very scientific way of sitting down at my desk and thinking of about a dozen people that I love and trying to capture the four or so criteria that I think express the feeling or attitude that I have towards them. So that is, that is not a very scientific method. This is the, James Gregory is probably really upset somewhere. But that moral psychology is a difficult thing to do. And I think that these kinds of questions are ones where philosophers should be in much greater touch with actual psychologists. But this is my kind of unscientific list about what I think of when I think of love as a potentially moral attitude. First, I think that when we love someone, we're emotionally vulnerable to them. So that means being disposed to feel the right kinds of emotions based on what happens to them. So if I love my youngest brother, Connor, then I feel excited when he finds out he got a good score on the LSATs. That's what happened a few months ago. And I'd feel devastated if I discovered that he had a diagnosis of a really difficult medical challenge. That, thankfully, has not happened. So it just means our emotions are linked up to them in the right kinds of ways. Second thing love requires is hoping that things go well for a person. This doesn't mean 
hoping that their desires get satisfied or that they think that their lives are going well. You can love people who are in the grips of addiction. You can love people who are actually not that great of people. We're going to get to that in a second. But loving them does mean wishing the best for them, even if they don't know what the best is. You hope for their flourishing. Third thing, this comes from the Greeks, and it's something that's resonated quite a bit with me. I'd be interested to see if you guys feel the same. Aristotle, at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, so if you go back 2,300 years ago to the Lyceum, Aristotle's teaching his class about the good life, and he spends a lot of time on love and friendship in his class. And when he's teaching his students about the nature of friendship, he says, your real friends are another self. They're like, it's like you living out in the world through them when you really love another person. So what does that mean? I really love my, I really love both my brothers, but I keep picking Connor as the example. When I think of Connor as a second self, it's not only that I'm emotionally sensitive to whether he passed the LSATs, but when Connor gets a really good score on this exam, I feel like I got a great score on the LSATs. Even though I didn't, I couldn't answer any of the questions on that stupid exam, and I didn't study for it at all. And I'm not going to be a lawyer when I grow up. But because he's like a second self to me, his successes in life feel as though they're part of my successes in life. And likewise, his challenges or failures in life, including his moral failures, feel like they're mine. So that's the third criteria. Really interestingly, everything we've said so far about love as a potentially moral attitude is just about what goes on in our feelings and our minds about towards people that we love, not anything necessarily that we do two or four people we love. That's the fourth criteria. When you love somebody, you want to do things to make their lives go well. You're disposed to do things to make their lives go well. You might not be able to do those things, but you would want to do them. For example, maybe I really love Ryan Gosling. We'll come back to him in a second. Ryan's rich. He really has all of his needs met, I think, currently in life. There's not very much I can do to promote Ryan Gosling's flourishing. But if I had the chance to do it, I would. Likewise, if we imagine being in a loving relationship with somebody like God, there's literally nothing that we could do to make God flourish any more than he's currently flourishing if you believe in God. But if I could, then I would. And that's OK just to have that disposition as part of what it would mean to love him. Whereas your enemies, you don't have that disposition at all. If I could make it so Connor's enemies would get bad scores on the LSATs, then I would I have a disposition to hold them back. And that's because I definitely don't love them. Kind of make sense? You can already think of counterexamples to this slide as well. Let's talk about the question that you all came here for tonight. And I'm already half an hour into my time. This is the part, this is the speed round where I start saying increasingly controversial things more quickly. Are there any reasons to love another person, to, to develop a particular attitude towards another person that follows this format? And if so, what would be our reasons for love? Philosophers have worried about this question quite a bit, and they've said interesting but controversial things to try to answer it. I don't think any of the answers are easy or common sense. So one of the things I'd like to just show you is how hard this question is to answer. And I'm going to lay out four different options that other philosophers have put on the table for trying to answer this question, show you why they all struggle, and then I'll suggest agapism is the fifth option, which is also just as controversial. But at the very least, it's, it's, it belongs in the fight. And that's when we'll turn it over to Q&A. So here are the different theories you might take a look at. The first one comes from my guy, Aristotle. This is often attributed to Aristotle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. I don't actually think it's fair to saddle real historical Aristotle with this view. It's a view that he kind of inspired because of this one passage in the Nicomachean Ethics. But he says other things about love that, make, that are pretty different. So this is an Aristotelian-flavored vision about what our reasons are to love other people. It's sometimes called the quality theory. And basically, Aristotle's theory in this passage is that when we love another person, we love them in virtue of their great personal qualities. Personal qualities, not the specific qualities that they have, but their qualities of being a great person. For Aristotle, being a good or flourishing person means having the virtues. So a good person is courageous and generous and prudent. A good person is successful in various ways, is magnanimous. That's one of the Aristotelian virtues, which I had to Google when I first started reading Aristotle. Magnanimous means he's so rich he can give stuff away. That's a great virtue for Aristotle. 
And so Aristotle always seems to indicate at some points that when we love another person, we love them because they have these good qualities. And if we discover that our friend or the person that we love has lost those good qualities, then you should dump that friend. This was also a surprisingly popular view at St. Leonard's today. <laughs> Which surprised me because this is the worst view. Aristotle does not have a problem with arbitrariness on this view. Because he literally says, love other people based on the non-arbitrary good qualities that they have. Love should just track non-morally significant qualities that other people have. The trouble with Aristotle's view, besides the fact that it seems to treat your friends as just like walking buckets of virtue, is that it seems really implausible, both as a way of predicting how we actually love other people and explaining our intuitions about what kinds of love are moral or immoral. So I can think of 10 good counterexamples to the quality theory. Maybe I'll give you guys five. Here's the first one. Up on this slide, we have Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, the Winklevoss twins, both epitomes of Greek virtue. They're courageous. They're like Olympic rowers. They're fabulously wealthy. I think now they own one of the big cryptocurrency firms. They helped found Facebook. They're really smart. They're identical twins, and they do everything together. Let's suppose that I come to meet Cameron, and I love him in virtue of all of his courageous, magnanimous, excellent Olympic rowing capability virtues. And then Cameron is killed. At the funeral, I meet Tyler, who had all of the same qualities as Cameron. Should I feel any moral pressure because of the non-arbitrariness principle or my moral code to transfer all the love that I had for Cameron onto Tyler? Can Cameron or Tyler fill the Cameron-sized hole in my heart? A lot of us have the intuition that that's not the way love works. I can have two coffee mugs. Suppose I have a coffee mug I really love because it, it keeps my coffee warm and it's beautiful and it's just the right size for my car's cup holder. And then I accidentally break it one day and I find exactly the same coffee mug at the store. It totally makes sense for me to use the new coffee mug to replace the one that I've lost, especially if those are all the features that I valued initially in the coffee mug. But a lot of us think when it comes to love and relationships, you can't perform that kind of substitution. There's something about my history with Cameron that's incredibly important, or the particularity of Cameron that just means he can't be substituted the same way we substitute a coffee mug. But Aristotle's quality theory would seem to indicate that those substitutions are fine, because it's the qualities that we admire, not the particular individual. There's a worse challenge. Let's go back to Ryan. So I love Cameron Winklevoss, and then Judith makes me aware of the existence of Ryan Gosling, who is more courageous than Cameron, far more magnanimous, more all-around athletic. He has all of Cameron's virtues and many others in spades. Should I feel moral pressure to trade up from Cameron Winklevoss to Ryan Gosling? That's the equivalent of like finding a better coffee mug. A lot of us feel this intuition that, no, I mean, there's something wrong with people who are constantly trying to like cycle up and improve their friendships and their loves in this way. You shouldn't try to improve or optimize loving other people the same way you might do that for coffee mugs or for stocks. It gets worse. So I'm thinking about Ryan Gosling and thinking about breaking things off with Cameron and initiating a love for Ryan Gosling because he's far more virtuous than Cameron is. And then Judith makes me aware of the existence of Pope Francis, who forget about courage and magnanimity. Francis has like all the super virtues, but in spades, he's incredibly generous, he's incredibly smart, he's incredibly holy. He is a moral saint. He's a perfection example of human beings. And Judah says, would you rather be in love with Ryan Gosling or with Pope Francis? And I pause for a second. <laughs> and I say, Ryan. I admire, I admire Pope Francis. I really admire Pope Francis. And I'm so glad that the world has created him and he exists. And I'm glad that he's doing all of his Pope things. And he gives away all of his money. And he never tells dirty jokes. 
But, to be quite honest, I love Ryan more. I love Ryan more. And it's partially because Ryan's not so great. Ryan tells mean jokes. Ryan hates some people. He gossips. Ryan sometimes doesn't give away all of his money. Sometimes spends it on like a yachting expedition around Corsica. And I'm interested in that. I might really genuinely find a reason for love for another person in their vice. And Aristotle definitely can't explain that. That's like loving a coffee mug because it's busted. But that does seem to be a large part of like why we in fact enjoy the people that we enjoy in our lives is because they have these amoral or immoral features. So equality theory is going to struggle there. It gets still worse. There's also this question or objection long-standing in virtue ethics to Aristotle that his view of friendship has what Bernard Williams calls one thought too many. So I'm giving you my poor family. They're the subject of uh, unwitting, unconsenting subjects of all of these philosophy talks. Let me introduce you to some more of my family members. There's my mom and dad, Mary and Liam Sullivan. That's my little niece, Kale, who's about to have her first birthday in just a couple weeks. So suppose I have the option of purchasing exactly one birthday present three weeks from now. And I can either purchase that birthday present for Kale Sullivan. Yes, you might be wondering, is there a little girl that somebody actually named Kale that lives in the United States? And the answer to that is yes, and that person was my brother. <laughs> I can purchase a birthday present for Kale, or I can purchase a birthday present for an anonymous one-year-old in St. Andrews, Scotland. And Eric asks me who I will purchase the birthday present for, and I say, I'm going to buy the present for Kale. And the reason I'm going to buy the present for Kale is because she's courageous and generous for a baby and smart and athletic. And I start to point to her virtues. Or maybe I think like living in a society where aunts purchase birthday presents for their own nieces rather than strangers tends to promote a more efficient gift giving economy, blah, 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 blah. You might think that I've had one thought too many about how to give presents to my niece. In fact, it should be totally appropriate to give the following one premise argument for my decision to give birthday presents to my niece and not strangers. And that one premise argument would be, I love Kale, therefore Kale gets the birthday present. For somebody like Aristotle to have to defend our reasons of love by going through these kind of neutral moral qualities of people. It just seems to be not what a loving attitude is. Loving attitudes are direct. They, they really focus and attend to the person that we have those attitudes toward. They're not mediated by our moral theories or our moral judgments about those people. So Aristotle's going to struggle with that question. And actually, this one thought to many problem becomes extremely important for how we understand Samaritanism more broadly as a moral code, a topic I am surely not going to have time to get to today, but just to put that on your radar. So quality theory it doesn't seem to be a great theory for our reasons for love. What are some other options? Don't worry, we're going to speed up a little bit here. Let's jump to the 1990s and skip over almost 2,000, over 2,000 years of philosophy and look at Harry Frankfurt, really wonderful moral philosopher at Princeton who wrote a great book called Reasons of Love, defending a really different theory about where our reasons for love might come from. Frankfurt is what I would call a constructivist. And his basic idea is that when we first start to love another person, there is no reason at all for us to love them. We just kind of encounter them and either the attraction happens or the interest happens or maybe we discover that there are, there are our own biological offspring and that's what does it. But initially there's no good reason. What happens is we start loving people and then our act of paying attention to them in a loving way generates a morally significant reason. And it can generate that reason regardless of whether or not we have a relationship with them. Set that question aside for just a second because we're going to come to it. So, somebody like Frankfurt thinks that the act of loving constructs morally significant reasons. It doesn't respond to reasons that we find in other people the way Aristotle's theory does. So it seems that he's not going to have the same problems about substitution and trading up as Aristotle might have because he thinks, at the very least, once I've started loving Cameron Winklevoss, the act of attending to him in that way has created a reason to love him that can't be moved over to Tyler or to Pope Francis or to Ryan Gosling. 
So that's how he's going to solve that problem. But constructivism is going to inherit its own problems. If you remember, thinking back to half an hour ago, the beginning of this talk, you can already see where constructivism might have some challenges. One, Frankfurt's really not going to have anything interesting to say about somebody who starts to detect a racialized or highly arbitrary pattern in their own love lives. So for Frankfurt, it might be the case that somebody searching for friends or partners online tends, just as a matter of biological factor, more likely because they've ingested the toxic social culture in which they've been raised, they might tend to prefer people of a similar race. And they keep swiping right, or whatever the direction is, on those people. And Frankfurt says, initially, there's no reason at all to govern who you initially might love or seek out a loving relationship with. There's no reason at all. What happens is, once you've sought out those people, the act of loving them creates reasons to love them. So in fact, the white supremacist dater generates the own, the own, the own, her own moral reasons for continuing to support this really arbitrary racialized pattern in her affection for other people. Does this make sense to folks? This idea of if who we, in fact, happen to love, that's not governed at all by our moral reasons or by arbitrariness. What happens is once we start to love someone, it generates a moral reason to continue loving them. Then that's going to be really conservative in a bad way with respect to the racialized or unquestioned attitudes that we have in initially seeking out loving relationships. So that's going to be pretty tricky for somebody like Frankfurt. It gets a little bit worse, I think. Pause on Frankfurt for a second and look at a kind of hybrid theory that is very popular in contemporary moral philosophy, at least since like the 1980s when ethics of care got going. And, and this is a theory that a lot of my students also, I think, agree with. I might call this the relationship theory of love. It's a variant of constructivism, but it looks at one particular way in which we construct our moral, moral reasons to love another person. So this is a passage that comes from Nico Kolodny, a moral philosopher at Berkeley. I believe, or Cornell. Kolodny says that when we love another person, the morally significant reason for that love comes from relationships that we are building with that person. So it's not just that like any attitude of seeking out another person could construct a good reason for love, but it's relationships that give us a reason for love. So again, you think back to Cameron Winklevoss, why is it appropriate for me to love him and inappropriate for me to immediately transfer my love to his identical twin brother? It's not just the case that I've initially started loving Cameron. It's also that I pursued an ongoing historical interaction with Cameron that's created a relationship, and that relationship has given me a reason for love. You can see how this is closer to Frankfurt's view than to Aristotle's view, but it also has problems. One problem, I think, though Kolodny and relationship people will have sophisticated answers to this, one naive problem is trying to understand how relationship theory will handle certain kinds of cases of abuse. So let's suppose that we've got Poindexter, who's the high school nerd, and we've got Slick, who's the high school bully. And Poindexter really wants a relationship with Slick. He wants Slick to care about him. He wants Slick to pay attention to him. He wants to be in Slick's club. He would really love it if Slick, the bully, loved him. And Slick, actually, he also wants a relationship with Poindexter. But it's a relationship of torment and abuse and victimization. Slick really loves the fact that Poindexter walks into the diner and he has a chance to beat him up and embarrass him. They have an ongoing historical connection. Every day, they do something to each other. And every day, each person seeks out that relationship. But do we think that that relationship, the relationship of bullying and abuse and victimization, provides any moral reason for Poindexter to love his tormentor? I think the answer to that question is no. Just being a relationship, an histo ongoing historical interaction, is not a good moral reason for somebody to love another person. The good moral reason, whatever it is, has to be explained in some other way. It could be, if you're Aristotle, those are good qualities, or it could be some other moral theory. But, ju but just having the relationship doesn't seem to add anything morally significant. It gets a little bit worse. So many of us have the intuition that it's morally significant when somebody goes out of their way to love a complete stranger. 
And this starts to get us into this debate about Samaritanism and uh, this debate about how we treat strangers when we encounter them in social media. So a couple examples, I could, I've now collect these all in a folder on my computer. Examples of, uh, of successes and failures at Good Samaritanism. One example of this comes from where I live, right outside Chicago. Chicago is a horrible place, and so is northern Indiana. It's freezing cold, and from January to February, the environment is trying to kill you. We have these things called polar vortexes that usually roll through in January. The temperature gets really, really brutally cold. Your breath freezes in your nose. Your pipes freeze. A few years ago, there was a polar vortex in Chicago, and while I was bundling up in my house, Candace Payne went to a local hotel, booked out 30 hotel rooms using her own credit card, and then invited 30 homeless families to come stay in those hotel rooms until the temperature improved. She made them gift baskets, and she put them in each of the hotel rooms so that they had a nice warm place to stay and had things to do during the vortex when everything was shut down. That's pretty awesome. I read this story and thought, I should try to be more like her. At the very least, she's a moral hero. That's what loving other people is. Likewise, we read this story about the French. hope there are no French people at this talk. This particular example about Parisians who a photographer had a heart attack on the streets of Paris a few years ago. And he was dying. He was desperately in need of help. Hundreds of people passed him by on the street, and not a single person bothered to stop to see what was going on, and he passed away. We think, man, there's something wrong with like just this shred of human love that no Parisian could muster to try to figure out what was going on with this guy before he died. There's something like awful about that. How do we understand how love could possibly mediate our relationship with strangers if we have one of these relationship, or even the broader constructivist theory? I think it's hard to do. And I don't think that it's a question that we should easily give up on, because these questions about Samaritans are also really politically urgent, especially for those of us who are living in countries like the UK or the United States, where we're facing really serious systematic questions about how we should welcome or not strangers who are trying to come into our own midst. So that got me thinking, at the very least, I would like a theory of love for other people that explains why, at least sometimes, it's morally exemplary, morally wonderful, a paradigm case of love for somebody to discover that they have love for a stranger that moves them to help them. But if moral significant love requires having relationships, we can't explain what love of strangers is in a way that's morally significant. And this gets us into the teaching that was the title. I knew you guys thought I would come back to the title slide. Do we have reason to love absolutely everyone, or at least reason to love strangers? And if the core tenet of the Christian tradition is thinking that love of strangers is important and exemplary and guiding on our lives in some important way, then the relationship theory doesn't seem like it can be a philosophical theory of love that supports that. Let me go through one more quick option, and then we'll finally get into agapism. That's my parable of the Good Samaritan picture, by the way, if you're wondering. So this gets us up into the 21st century, and a philosopher who I think is profoundly interesting at MIT named Kieran Satia, who's been writing about that one thought too many problem we saw a minute ago, and also writing about our reasons for love. And he defends a view that's in the neighborhood, I think, of Christian teaching about love, but has a really interesting twist. I think the twist is really interesting, but it's wrong. So Kieran Satya takes a left where I would like to take a right. But I'd like to introduce you to his theory, because my theory ultimately is going to be a response to his. He doesn't call his theory the mere humanity theory, but I think that's a nice way to capture it. The basic idea for Kieran Satya is that somebody's mere human dignity is all of the reason that you need to love them. So you don't have to find people who are courageous or generous or magnanimous or all those Aristotle qualities. Just having human dignity is enough reason to love you. But, he says, he's uncomfortable with this idea that we have a reason to love absolutely everyone. That's crazy, according to Satya. So the way that we're going to get out of that problem while still defending everything that we've said about why the relationship theory is wrong and the quality theory is wrong, is by arguing that there are two different kinds of moral reasons out there in the world. And that some reasons 
including reasons of love, give us license to do certain things, but no way pressure us to do those things. So I'm going to introduce you guys to one more fancy philosophical distinction today, and you can take this home. If people asked what you learned at St. Andrews this evening, this will be the thing that you learned. Kansatia makes this really important distinction between what he calls insistent and non-insistent moral reasons. The way we think reasons normally work is we think that they're always insistent, I would, I would argue. So what do I mean by an insistent reason? We give people reasons to do things all the time. So suppose I'm talking to Andrew, and I decide right before dinner tonight, I'm going to convince Andrew to be a vegetarian. I'm going to start supplying him reasons. Maybe I say, Andrew, eating meat is bad for the environment, reason number one. Eating plants are really healthy for you, reason number two. And there are plenty of really delicious plant-based meals becoming available in St. Andrews. That's reason number three. And as I offer him these reasons, if he accepts them, the pressure starts to mount for Andrew to become a vegetarian. It's just the way reasons work. They pressure you to respond to them. That's what insistent reasons are. We just called them reasons until a minute ago. Satya thinks that there's another set of reasons which can, you can cite as your reason for wanting to do something. And they give you permission to do something, but they don't pressure you in that way. And his challenge is to try to explain what this could be, because he wants to use this to explain what our reasons for love are. So here's the best example I can think of. I don't find any uncontroversial examples in his work. Let's suppose Andrew comes to me as his friend and is asking whether or not he and his wife should have another child. And I say, OK, well, let's talk about this. Let me give you some reasons. I think you should have another child. And here's the first reason. Population of the United Kingdom is going down. And if you guys had another child, that would slightly increase population. I don't know if that's true. I just made it up. Second, global population is maybe going down. Or I don't know. Second reason is, if you had a child, that child would exist, and people enjoy existing, and it's a good thing, generally, to create more modes of enjoyment in the world. Reason three, you clearly love being parents, and I think if you had another child to parent for even longer, you would love that even more. So give him these reasons for having children. And you might think, any of those reasons, if he and his wife decide to have another child, and somebody asks them what the reason is, they could cite one of those reasons I gave them. I was concerned with low population numbers in St. Andrews. I thought being a parent would be fun. I wanted to create another mode of conscious existence in world history. You could cite any of those reasons, and that would license his decision to become a parent. But supplying him those reasons doesn't pressure him to have a kid. Like, as I added more of those reasons, it didn't like turn up the heat for Andrew and his wife to make another person. And that's because our reasons for creating people maybe are non-insistent in this way. So Tia wants to argue that our reasons for loving other people are similarly non-insistent. We become aware of somebody's dignity, my little niece Kale's dignity, Ryan Gosling's dignity. And on that basis, that's good enough. That's a strong reason to love them. We don't have to cite any other features of those people. But if you ask why I love Ryan Gosling, but I don't love Pope Francis, I actually do love Pope Francis, why well, I don't love another great person, or why I love my own niece, but I don't love a stranger's one-year-old, I can just say reasons for love are non-insistent, and I'm choosing to respond to Kale's dignity and Ryan Gosling's dignity, and I'm choosing to ignore yours. This is a little weird. I mean, one thing that we notice about Satya's view, and he just bites the bullet on this, is that he is going to give us no help at all with that arbitrariness problem. Satya even addresses one of the worst counterexamples to his views. He says, like, suppose you wake up one morning, suppose he wakes up one morning, and he feels that attitude of love, that intense vulnerability and concern for his own son and for exactly one kid that's in his son's preschool class. And he doesn't feel that about any of the other kids. He doesn't act on his feelings of love towards that one kid. That would be wrong. There are plenty of good rules involving how you respond to strangers' children. So he doesn't buy that kid birthday presents. He doesn't try to pick up that kid from school or do anything that would be inappropriate given the lack of a parental relationship. But he just loves that one kid and his kid and none of the other kids. This theory seems to say it's fine. All the kids have dignity. 
The reasons are non-existent, so you can choose how you respond or not, and he chooses to respond to the dignity of his own kid and then that one other kid and none of the other kids. So Tia says, that's my view, and as long as you don't act inappropriately on those reasons of love or mistake them for reasons of relationship, you're fine. But are you fine? I mean, again, we get asked questions. Suppose that Satya notices he only loves, this would not be true of Kieran, but it might be true of another person, he only loves the white kids in his son's class. And he notices that pattern. All of the kids in his class have dignity, but he only chooses to respond to the dignity of people who fall in a particular group. Is there something morally significant about that? And if there is, which presumably all of us agree there is, is it significant because it's a defect in how he loves or because it's coming up against some other important moral reason. I think it shows a defect in how he loves. And that's why the non-arbitrariness worry is such a worry when we think about our reasons for love. So now I'm about to land the plane. I told you I was gonna say increasingly controversial things and hopefully that's happened. One of my goals in this chapter of the book and in this talk is to try to convince you first off that it's hard to come up with a satisfactory theory about what our reasons for loving other people are. And given that difficulty, a fifth view that's inspired by the Christian tradition ought to have at least a fighting chance. And this is a view that we can now articulate in some detail given all the work that we've done. It's a view I would call agapism, though it's probably not the best name, and I'm sure the theologians in the audience are gonna have something to say about that. This is the view, though, that mere humanity or mere dignity, some really general feature of humans, gives us a reason to love them. Now, what I'm not saying is that we love the property of humanity as a property, or we love all of humanity as an idea. What I mean to say is that every single particular individual that we encounter that has dignity or humanity their dignity, their particular dignity, is a reason to love them. And it's a strong reason to love them. It's a reason that's just as strong as the reason that you have for loving your own children or your niece or your brothers or Ryan Gosling. So that's the rational basis for love. And that reason, and this is where we get into Satya's argument, it's an insistent reason. It's not a reason that you can pick and choose how you attend to. It's something that's governed by that non-arbitrariness principle. And this is an extraordinarily demanding moral theory, which we should probably expect given where its roots are. And the challenge for a philosopher like me is to explain how we would live with such a demanding moral theory. How would we understand our moral shortcomings in light of that? How might we want to change our loving attitudes? How might we want to advise Mark Zuckerberg or the people that run Match.com to change their algorithm if we believe that a moral code like this is true? Those are significant questions. I have a lot of thoughts about them. I also have a really um, interesting idea, which we definitely won't have enough time for in this Q&A, about how this modern moral theory connects to the traditional teachings about the parable of the Good Samaritan, which one thing I hope you'll notice is in all of the debates that we've had so far, not invoked divine revelation or any special status that any particular religious group has in knowing what love is when other groups don't. In fact, this has been a perfectly general moral philosophy argument that's been engaged with just big debaters in ethical theory. How do we connect what seems like a secular moral theory about love to what the traditional religious teaching is? And maybe how do we take a 21st century philosophical perspective on that old teaching in a way that might help us understand it in new ways? These are all questions that are very interesting, but I've gone on way too long, so now we can start the battle royale phase of this evening where you disagree or agree. I shouldn't have taken a poll. Actually, I still will. I still have the mic for one more second. Okay. So should we love absolutely everyone? If you, This was the question I gave to the students at St. Leonard's today. If you had a pill that for one year would cause you to adopt that attitude of love that we described earlier in the talk towards absolutely everyone, would you take such a pill? Would you make yourself into the kind of person who would love absolutely everyone? Who says yes? Ah, oh, this is much more heartening, Judith, than what the high schooler said. Who says no? Absolutely not. 100% of the students at St. Leonard's agreed with you. There was one student who didn't. He was a, yeah, he was a confederate. Um, <laughs> all right, so thank you, and now we'll have time for discussion.